The next speaker is Lisa Wolf, and Lisa Wolf is a pulmonologist who's at Northwestern. And Lisa and I, many of you in the crowd probably know both of us because we're the tag team that does the heart and the lungs for a lot of neuromuscular patients here in Chicago. So we've been uh, partners working together for quite some time. And so I'm truly delighted that she was able to finish rounds this morning <laughs> and get here in time to be able to give the talk today. And um, you're up and going, and okay, great. the arrows will move you forward and backwards. Okay, great. So um, thank you very much, and I'm going to try to make up some time here because we're running a little behind. But I want to start with a case because I think it helps to illustrate a lot of things that can go on. Um, and this is actually a real case that um, was uh, someone who was 37 years old with Becker muscular dystrophy, and he presented to our emergency room with complaints of cough and fever. He was not able to bring up any sputum, although he felt there was sputum in his chest, and he was having a very hard time breathing. And the first thing we did in our emergency room was this chest x-ray. And you can see in this chest x-ray here is his heart. And Dr. McNally would be the first to point out that his heart is very large. But I'm going to leave that part of the discussion to her following me. But what you'll see from me is that these black areas here are the lungs. Trust me, they're small. And then this white area here represents a pneumonia. And you'll note that it's a pneumonia in the base of the lung rather than the top or the middle of the lung. So I was called to see this patient, and the first thing I did was to do some lung function testing to see how strong the diaphragm muscles are. So the first thing that we did was to obtain what's called a vital capacity test. I'm going to show you how that's done. But we look at how large a breath you can blow out. And he was only able to blow out 36% of what he should. And when he was sucking in, though, it was pretty normal. He was able to reach 120, which is about as strong as you would expect to see. And we brought him into the hospital and started giving him antibiotics for the pneumonia. And although he was getting better, his nurse was noticing that frequently his oxygen levels would drop. And they would drop significantly. And she'd walk in the room, and he was asleep. And she would wake him up, and his saturations would come back to normal. So we said, you know what, there's probably something going on with his sleep. And so we recorded his sleep, and it's right in front of you here, and I'm going to sort of walk you through this. This top line here, here it is, this top line here represents sleep. When this bar here is at the top, he's awake. When the bar goes to the bottom here, he's asleep here. And then when we have these black bars here, he's dreaming. Sorry, this actually got one ahead of me. Um, here are the, the black bars when he's dreaming. And down here we have the oxygen levels. And here you'll see that on this scale we'd like him to be 88 to 90 or above. But every time we're in one of these black bar areas with the dreams, the oxygen levels plummet. And they plummet pretty reliably every time he gets to a dream. And so what we did was to go ahead and this time give him a machine called a non-invasive ventilator. I'm going to show you what that looks like. And what you'll notice is that as we increase the pressures, and here you see the pressures are low, and then they get higher, and then they get higher here. By the time we get to the highest setting, he can even be in the middle of a dream right here, and the oxygen levels stay normal. They don't drop anymore, and everything is back to baseline. So he continued to complain about difficulty getting that sputum up. And so we did what's called airway clearance. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute. But with aggressive support of his ventilation and with aggressive airway clearance, he was able to resolve the pneumonia. And you'll see that even with the pneumonia, whoops, even with the pneumonia resolved, he still has small lungs and a big heart. But the pneumonia itself is gone, and he was able to heal the infection. So let's talk about some of the salient points that come out of this case. The first is that we should be measuring lung function for anyone with muscular, Becker's muscular dystrophy or any form of neuromuscular disease. And this probably looks familiar to anyone who's been to one of our Muscular Dystrophy Association clinics. This is a device you blow into, and it allows me to measure how big your breaths are. This number here from being able to blow all the way out to being able to take a breath all the way in. That's called the vital capacity, or the forced vital capacity. And we look at how big your breath is as compared to someone on average, your age, your size, and your weight, so that we can assess how effective your breathing is. 
what we know in Becker muscular dystrophy is that if we look at the total amount of breath that you can get in and out, the vast majority of people are normal, meaning that they are above 80%. But if you look at folks who are using a wheelchair, the use of a wheelchair is a marker for drop in lung function. And so we know that anytime someone starts to be in a power chair, we need to look at their breathing more carefully. Although I would argue that we should be watching it periodically the entire course of the disease. In addition, if we repeat a uh, lung function testing for those with Becker muscular dystrophy, if we repeat it when they're laying down as compared to sitting up, what we'll find is that there is again a significant number of people whose lung function looked good sitting up, but when they lay down it starts to drop and it can drop significantly. I want you to think about the fact that the diaphragm is this muscle here under your lung and when you're sitting up or standing up, gravity is your friend and it's helping to bring that muscle down. When we lay you down, we look at how that muscle does when you're asleep or when you're not getting help from gravity. And frequently in that supine position, we can highlight or bring out abnormalities that may be difficult to see otherwise. Now the question is, does the type of genetic um, abnormality within Becker muscular dystrophy have an impact? And Lisa Delafave just went through those kinds of variations with you. Now if we look at very large groups of patients, and in this study there were over 150 patients evaluated, what was found is that Becker muscular dystrophy patients um, who have duplications rather than deletions have milder respiratory impairment and if you look at anyone at an older age, regardless of what their genetics are, they seem to be worse. The problem is that what, uh, what was done later was to look at sibling pairs. So these are boys within the same family. And now we're not looking at a huge group. Now we're looking at small groups, okay? So we can see a trend on a large epidemiologic level that genetics seems to make a difference. But if we look at any sibling pair within families, the differences are not 100% predictive of what will happen with lung function. And what you see here is an example of a brother pair that was followed by Dave Bernkrant in Cleveland. And what they found is that at about 14 years of age, all the Becker muscular dystrophy patients reach about their peak lung function. And it will start to decline from there. Those that do not reach a high or normal level of lung function by 14 will not continue to get better over time. They will continue to get worse. In this graph, you'll see two different brothers, one here and one here. And you'll notice that given the same mutation, this brother has much more stability in his lung function as compared to this brother who seems to have a significant drop over time with lung function. Highlighting to us that we need to look at what that peak is at age 14 as a significant marker and that we cannot 100% rely on genetics to help us find our phenotype or experience expression of disease level. So what are the themes that we have looking at the lung function testing data from Becker muscular dystrophy? Theme number one, the older you are, the more likely you are to have abnormal lung function. Theme number two, if you require the use of a power chair, you are more likely to have abnormal lung function. And theme number three, although genotype, meaning the kind of mutation you have, can be in important information, it is not a 100% predictor of your phenotype or risk of having lung function abnormalities. More importantly, I would ask an even more fundamental question, which is, does looking at your ability to breathe during the day, is that the right test? Now, what you're looking at here is a schematic that applies to all neuromuscular diseases. And what we're showing here is that if you look over time, abnormalities in sleep occur way before we see daytime abnormalities here. Suggesting to us, like the patient in our case, that we need to screen for nighttime abnormalities first. And so what I'm going to do here is give you a comparison of nighttime breathing abnormalities between patients with neuromuscular disease like Becker muscular dystrophy compared to their heart failure cohorts who may have similar lung function but without Becker muscular dystrophy. 
when they do sleep studies, both patients, both heart failure patients and neuromuscular patients, may be labeled with the same diagnosis, central sleep apnea. And they may complain of sleep loss type symptoms, such as headaches, sleepiness, or restless sleep. But they are very, very different in the causes and the manifestations. Those with Becker muscular dystrophy hypoventilate. Their CO2 levels raise at night. Whereas those with heart failure tend to overbreathe and have pauses to compensate for that overbreathing. The neuromuscular patient will get into trouble during dream sleep, like in the case that we saw, whereas the classic heart failure patient without neuromuscular disease has problems in non REM or non dream sleep. And the neuromuscular patient's hallmark will be a relatively elevated CO2 on blood testing, whereas the heart failure patient will have a low CO2. This is important because it changes the way we deliver therapy to our patients. Although both patients, those with neuromuscular disease and those with heart failure without neuromuscular disease, will benefit from having the head of bed up or sleeping on their side, they will all benefit in terms of their breathing for having improved heart failure management and avoiding narcotic medications. But there are things that are very different between the two. And those with neuromuscular disease, we like to use devices that are called bi-level, sometimes called BiPAP or VPAP, but they should say ST at the end. Whereas those that have heart failure will need a servo-style ventilator called ASV. Now, I don't have time to get through the differences in the technology. It's important to remember, though, that if a heart failure sleep specialist says to you, here's an ASV device, it's important to say, no, I have muscular dystrophy. I need to have an ST device. ASV is not appropriate for me. We may use different diuretics. For instance, in a heart failure patient, we may need to use acetazolamide, something that reverses alkalosis. And we'll use oxygen as a way of treating them. Oxygen is specifically contraindicated in neuromuscular disease because it causes worsening of CO2 retention. So although they seem very similar on the surface, they need very different approaches for their treatment. And in the end, this is what these devices look like. You'll see this man has a tube here going into his nose, and he has this little box here at his bedside, and his wife is pleasantly sleeping, being not disrupted at all. Yeah, well, okay. I will say, though, that it is my job as your sleep and pulmonary physician to make that as realistic as possible. And the other thing I'm going to do is help to avoid that basilar collapse that we saw in our patient who had the pneumonia, where the pneumonia was at the base. We're going to increase the size of the breaths here so that there's equal opening of air sacs throughout the lung. Now, there's a couple of ways that we're going to do this besides the use of our non-invasive ventilator, and that is called airway clearance. Airway clearance is going to focus on a couple of things, the first of which is loosening secretions. And of course, like everything else, there are do's and don'ts for loosening secretion in those with neuromuscular diseases. Do, use a therapy vest. Now you can see this on this little girl here, and basically this is a shaking device that helps to loosen secretions at the bases. And she's using this in combination with an inhaled medication to help loosen secretions and bring them up. What are the don'ts? Don't use drying agents in your nebulizers that could make the secretions thicker or harder to get out. Don't use this device, which is an incentive spirometer. That's for people with normal neuromuscular function who just has to perk up a little bit and take a little bit bigger breath. Our patients need more assistance than to just perk up. And so anything like this, uh, uh, whoops, sorry, anything like this, which is an acapella, or anything like this that is an incentive spirometer is inappropriate for patients with neuromuscular disease. In addition, in addition we want to enhance the cough make the cough stronger. Remember, that was a big part of a problem with our patient. He could not take an effective cough. We're going to review very quickly four different kinds of cough assistance techniques. The first is called a manually assisted cough. A manually assisted cough is where a friend or a family member actually supports the belly to help you take a bigger breath in and then pushes in and up to help complete the cough. And that's something that's great because it can be done anywhere, anytime, without power. Another uh, version of a uh, cough technique that can be done without electricity 
is called the AMBU bag with lung volume recruitment. This, for those of you who don't know, is an AMBU bag. This is just a silicone bag. It is attached with tubing and this, which is a one-way valve. It can be used either with a mouthpiece or a mask. And you'll see here, these are just two examples. I didn't have a kyphoscoliosis patient, unfortunately, to show you. I'm sorry, a becromuscular dystrophy patient. So I'm showing you one here with kyphoscoliosis and here a patient with a cervical spinal cord injury, but it's the same principle. You'll see that their inherent airflow here in the red is much smaller, and when they use this AMBU bag to inflate their lungs more fully, they're able to take a larger breath and a larger cough. This is a mechanical device to do the same thing. This is called an in exaflator or a mechanical cough assist. Sometimes it's called an MIE, which is a mechanical in exaflator. And this device both blows the breath in and sucks the breath out, helping to completely replace the inability of the diaphragm and accessory muscles to cough for a patient. What's important about these devices, though, is that they don't have ready accessibility within hospitals. You'll see here that up to 60 to 80 percent of some hospitals that are especially private hospitals do not own a cough assist device. So especially here in the U.S., we recommend that patients have their own mechanical cough assist because should they need them, that is the only way that they're going to have access to it. And then this data, which actually comes out of the Lou Gehrig's disease data, but it makes a good point, which is that there are multiple techniques that I've just shown you. The coached cough, an abdominal thrust, breath stacking with an AMBU bag, even using your BiPAP machine or non-invasive ventilator to help you cough, or using a cough assist. We have lots of choices here. But the bottom line is that if we look at peak cough flow, which is the PCF here, any given patient may do well with any of the above techniques. My job as a pulmonologist is to allow you to find what works best with you, to teach you multiple techniques and allow you to pick what's going to be your best solution. Um, so in summary, I'd like to say that what we reviewed today is the most important task for myself as a pulmonologist involved in your care is to start by evaluating your lung function. Then to consider early disease that may be occurring during sleep and to solve those problems early. We also want to come up with a good and effective airway clearance plan so that we can help both to prevent and treat pneumonia and also so that we can support Dr. McNally in her attempts to help support your heart. And of course, this is my way of leading into her talk and to thank you very, very much, MDA, for inviting me as well as Dr. McNally and Lisa Delafave.